Hey, I want to give you a little book reaction to this book I uh, read today. It's The Total State by Aurid McIntyre. Uh, it's not a long book, 170 or thereabouts pages. Uh, the Total State, How Liberal Democracies Become Tyrannies. So he had a journey similar to what someone you and I have had. Like uh, back about four years ago, we had the big year 2020 and all the interesting things that happened in that year. And he really looked around himself and said, wow, things don't work the way I thought they work. And so here he makes an interesting comment. Conservatives and libertarians who had spent their whole lives railing against government tyranny found ways to excuse and deflect. When tyranny came, nothing happened. So he's talking about how uh, back when all these uh, rules, executive orders, mandates, and so on came down in 2020, that uh, a lot of people who'd been complaining about big government for years upon years, uh, they didn't do anything. They just, we all just kind of knuckled under. And he was kind of shocked by all that. And you've probably heard a, a sentiment expressed about uh, often we pray. We're, you know, in a church and we give thanks to God and we'll give thanks and say, oh, thank you, God, that we have all this freedom. Well, uh, we may not have as much freedom as we, we think we have. So he's going to say this process has been going on a long time, but here's what he says here. Those who cannot express the mildest opinion in public, who cannot raise their children in their own values, or in many cases afford to have children at all, see themselves as ambassadors of freedom to the world. Those who can be forced to wear a mask, have their businesses and churches shut down, and be functionally trapped in their homes, while groups favored by the ruling class are allowed to burn and loot cities, still cling to the narrative of ever-increasing liberty. And he asks, you know, why is that? Why is it that people can say we have so much liberty when uh, these very people were pinned in their homes? Meanwhile, uh, there were groups rioting in the streets during that year and, and burning in some of our cities and destroying things and gathering together. But the law-abiding people sort of hunkered down as they were told. So why did these changes come to us? And he's got some interesting things he says about that here. So he asks the questions. He's comparing uh, totalitarian societies like Nazi Germany, uh, Soviet Union, and our culture today. And he says, you know, there was state government centralized censorship in the USSR. There was censorship in Germany. It, was come, it came by force. Why is it that today uh, we seem to all think the same way or go right along with what we're told? He comes up with a couple of different thinkers. Some of these you probably haven't heard of these folks before. I know I really haven't heard of them, but a fellow named Yarvin, he says his answer is, is that there is a decentralized network of organizations and individuals responsible for manufacturing cultural consensus, and he calls it the cathedral. Now, so the idea is that there's sort of like a self-perpetuating mechanism. There's a reason why things work out the way they do, and there's a reason why we all kind of, we sort of control each other. Large-scale information manipulation is required for leaders in a democracy to keep power, uh, but he says that does not in itself lead to a total state. When newspapers had a monopoly on information distribution, they could be relied on to deliver a plurality of voters armed with the correct opinion. You didn't have to fool all the people all the time, just meet a threshold high enough to maintain power. This meant the government did not have to seek total hegemony. It was the internet that changed this in a dramatic way. So then he goes on and talks about how social media makes everybody, everything is important, everybody's opinion's important, and so you've got to control everybody's opinion. Here he says on page seven, in a total state, everyone and everything is infused with power, everyone matters, everyone is either a collaborator or a dissident. And so uh, everything is a political cult, more or less, he says. So yeah, you're, you're surrounded by workers, coworkers, everybody knows what should be said. Each is constantly attempting to ensure not only that no wrong thing is ever publicly expressed, but that a sufficient stream of right think is dutifully posted. And so uh, we sort of, there's this self-perpetuating mechanism that comes about that we all kind of, we don't want to say something that's too far out of the accepted stream. So we kind of police ourselves. So he asked this question, if there is no official state organ conduct coordinating the message, no Goebbels pushing this from the top down, then why is the German cat appearing everywhere? Because the Germans didn't force him to, make this big thing about the German cat. But the people sort of in, among themselves decided that the German cat was superior to all other cats, and maybe it is. So then he says the reason why is because there's something that he calls the cathedral. It's a decentralized network of, of organizations and individuals responsible for manufacturing a cultural consensus. And so basically, you know, the people at work, the media you listen to and watch and so on, it all comes together. Now this isn't really necessarily written from a religious standpoint, but listen to this. 
This is how the cathedral serves as a coordination mechanism between so many different organizations in our society. It provides them with the same religious values. So he kind of talks about this all as being a like a church. Everyone in power will thus have attended similar educational institutions and obtained their positions in a similar way. In a deeply Christian community, there was no need to ask what a code of ethics was being applied in any given situation, what rules would inform the decisions being made. No one was required to state out loud that Christianity was the foundation of the society and that it dictated the terms of almost every decision. It was implicitly understood. The university serves as the modern church. No conspiracy is required to coordinate the actions of those who manufacture the narrative of our civilization because they all go to the same house of worship. So basically, the modern university is kind of like, uh, it's, it's like a, a secular church. It's, it's got its own set of values, and everybody gets credentials. Everybody who does something serious, they all have a credential. You know, I've got my degree from this university and that university. I've got a couple of them myself. So, uh, yeah, we've all kind of gone through this this certain system. And so people tend to think the same way because they're getting the same values uh, pushed along. And so the university serves, as he says, as a modern church. You don't need a conspiracy. You just kind of get everybody uh, going through the same system, and they come out supporting the same establishment. He goes on, and, and here's a full paragraph from page 15 I want to share. As odd as it sounds, we are governed by a decentralized atheistic theocracy. It kind of sounds like a contradiction, but listen. A religious system without an official holy book or central church, but a religious system of moral assumptions all the same. It is particularly difficult for Americans to perceive this due to our understanding of the public slash private distinction. We are trained to think that formal power officially centralized under the law by the government is the only path to tyranny. If power is distributed among non-state actors, it is thus difficult for Americans to see it as a threat. This is understandable as the Founding Fathers never envisioned a secular society where the entire ruling class received moral instruction exclusively from progressive universities before taking jobs that allowed them to deliver a narrative to a small box in every American's pocket 24-7. But this is the world we live in. So we often have thought about, you know, the, the government and the separation of church and state. And, and, you know, that does keep the government, at least in theory, it keeps it from promoting a certain religious view. But... We don't think a lot about the big corporations, about wealthy individuals, companies, uh, big corporations, which is interesting when you go back to Revelation 18, because as I've said before, when you go back there, you have really three sources of, of uh, uh, power. You have Babylon, which represents all false religion, and uh, which includes all false secular religion. You have the kings of the earth, which represents the political leaders and rulers. And you have the merchants of the earth, and most uh, half of the chapter is is dealing with the the merchants and you have there you have the big corporations Microsoft Apple Amazon and so on uh, General Motors uh, you have all those guys and these three combine uh, to basically run the world and then in Revelation 18 God intervenes and cuts it all down and we're, we're done so uh, but what we see today is we see those groups all inter interlocked and intermingled and working together and we see today a, a new a strong increase in the censorship issue that's going on now one of the key ideas here that uh, that I, I found really interesting from his book the total state is the um, the idea of the spheres of influence so what he says he reminds us that in earlier times there were various spheres of influence you know there was the church it had a sphere of influence there was the state, it had its influence. You had people in the arts, they, they did their thing, and, and you had different mercantile interests and so on. You had all these separated um, sets, uh, groups, spaces within which there was a certain influence. And, and then he goes on and talks about how those spheres have been uh, basically nuked. They've been wiped out. And today there's only one sphere, and that's the sphere of government. Everything kind of goes to that. And I can tell you this is very true. When we go to uh, uh, advertise a religious meeting we're going to hold in a town or something, it used to be very easy. You know, you've got a newspaper there. Uh, you know, half the people subscribe to that newspaper. You put an ad in the newspaper. Uh, there's a town square. Everybody meets in the same place. You can put up your posters there. Guess what? Today... Uh, you go to uh, advertise a meeting and how do you do it? Uh, the All these sections that used to have their own kind of subculture going on, uh, they, they're scattered. They're, everything is sort of fragmented and atomized. Uh, you, you have a, a challenge. How do you get to people? Uh, everything is very fragmented. You might find a place, a certain place on Facebook where most people in your community uh, talk to each other. Uh, but things are really in the safe. Facebook's extremely centralized, isn't it? 
Uh, so you, you, you've really got a, a, a great uh, change in these spheres. So check this out from page 19. It is the collapse of these competing social spheres that has allowed government to centralize and grow more totalitarian while making the individual feel more liberated. This is how it totalizes the government down the page. This is how totaling government has made unprecedented demands on its subjects without them feeling the squeeze. It replaced the competing social spheres that had previously served to check the power of the state and remove the extensive personal commitments they had entailed. And it goes through and talks about how people, you know, used to take care of their aging parents, uh, but now the state tends to do that, or some big corporation, some medical company. Uh, the children used to take care of their children, the education of their children, but now it's the state, you know, you put your child in a, in a, uh, a yellow uh, tubular vehicle and send them away and they're gone for hours and hours while the state tells them uh, good, good, important, wholesome things, hopefully. Uh, you know, we, we've offloaded that to the state. You go to work, you know, and you do your thing, and then you've got HR department, and they take care of all your insurance and medical needs. You've got to make sure they're on your your network, the doctor you use, and so on. Everything is kind of uh, sorted out in this kind of a way. And so the competing social spheres have sort of been blurred up and blended together into this managerial uh, state uh, that is, is orchestrated kind of ultimately by the government. And so the different sections and their different um, spheres of influence is very much under the thumb of the state and very highly regulated by the state. And so that's the case. So he's giving some pretty interesting answers here. One, re you know, reasons, I've never seen somebody who did, you know, uh, as much uh, careful analysis, how we got from 250 years ago to where we are today as a, demo as a republic, a democracy. Uh, he's sort of outlining how it happens. And he's talking about basically the big change came with the internet, but there were other things on the way, all along the way here. And uh, the different sections of our culture that used to be distinct and had their own influences. So at this point, everything, virtually everything is pretty heavily politicized. And the different things that you used to do or parents used to do for their kids or used to do for their aged parents, uh, things that we used to do for each other at church and so on, a lot of that is offloaded. It's offloaded, now it's done by the insurance company, now it's done by an employee, now it's done by uh, this group or that group or this agency. Uh, the church used to do a lot of educating. A lot of that is gone now. Uh, the church used to do a lot of the uh, social support in the community, but don't worry now, that's all done by the state. Uh, there's many government agencies and private companies that are given government money and they kind of help everybody that way. And yeah, we, we have a lot of stuff that's really kind of wired directly to the big, uh, the big government there in the middle. And so, yeah, we have interesting developments then that happen. It's kind of like he says here, I think, on page 20 that uh, really kind of nails it. There are in society, in addition to the state and the individual, social authorities as well, which also claim from the human being their due of obedience and services. See, our, our, the United States Constitution has all these guarantees in it that, you know, that more or less amount to church and state will be kept separate. But what we actually have, though, is today we have the merchant class and the that is, is doing a whole bunch of stuff. You know, your life, if you took away, uh, if we took away your devices and we took away your automobiles and took away all the things that connect you to government in this way and that way, uh, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be dead in the water, really. Uh, that's the way it would be for almost all people. There's a few people out on the edges, you know, there's a few people that uh, can grow their own food, but boy, you know what, the just-in-time shelf stocking in your big giant big box local store, what happened if there was a crisis and that stopped for uh, four days or something? You'd be in the way that you were back in 2020, right? You'd be hoping that when you got to the store, there'd be some uh, toilet paper there for you and, and maybe some other things that uh, stopped coming in quite as regular. So we have this, uh, we, 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 the, the, the breadth of our culture has shrunk and hollowed itself out. And so now we're very highly dependent on a few things. You know, we need got to get the government checks. We got to get uh, the, the, uh, them to pay for different medicines that we supposedly need. We've got to have the big box store so that we can eat. We've got to have a gasoline station so we can put gas in the car. Um, if we don't need that, we need, you know, electrical stuff coming into our homes. 
So we have all these pieces and our culture is dramatically changed and it's all wired in through the internet. If the internet went down for a couple days and then you couldn't get back on unless you, uh, the government gave you a government ID and you chose voluntarily to go on, um, what would you do? You know, got to get in, you got to do your banking, got to do your medicine. It's all online now. So yeah, well, if I, if I don't uh, sign up here, I won't, I won't be able to, we're, we're, we're really kind of stuck. And he's showing in this book a lot, at least in the first half of the book, I found the first half of the book much more stimulating and interesting uh, than, uh, than the latter part. But anyway, for whatever it's worth, yeah, he's, he's kind of marking out how, even though we have all these checks and balances, the checks and balances aren't working in the same way they're supposed to work because, because the internet has changed so many things and uh, the different spheres of, of society have sort of crashed and burned and we really just have, kind of have this one blob sphere uh, operating. So he talks here about how the government as a sphere of influence has worked really hard and done things that supposedly helped the family but have been extremely damaging to the family. I'm not gonna list them all. But he says here, uh, here's a paragraph of interest, page 24. There is a reason why every organ of power in the United States seems obsessed with introducing sexual and gender identity to children at an increasingly young age. Normalizing the idea of transsexual children is an incredibly useful tool for the regime because it can serve as a reliable wedge between kids and their parents. If children can choose their own gender, if the ability to choose their gender is a human right, then it becomes the duty of the government to protect that right. Protect that right from whom, you might ask? The parents, of course. So over here on the next page, he talks about uh, the government's response to COVID-19. Check this out. The government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic is an instructive example of this. The entire ordeal perfectly demonstrates how quickly the illusion of individual rights and limited government that modern liberal democracies have constructed can be hand waved away when the total state identifies an opportunity to expand its power. With no intermediate spheres of social influence competing for allegiance, the total state can use emergencies to swiftly rationalize exceptions to individual liberty and seize power with little to no resistance. And so, yeah, that sounds exactly like what we experienced just here a few years ago. There's one more thing I wanna bring out, at least one more thing, and then I guess maybe just some general comments we'll finish. But this is on page 32. And uh, I think this is one of the most important points of the whole book. So why are we having trouble getting along? Why, why do we have such uh, disparate uh, reactions to things? Why are there people that are completely over here and completely over there? Listen to this statement he has in this paragraph. Conservatives believe pointing out an abuse of power will shame their opponents into returning to the norms of equality. But this is far from the case. Listen, shame requires a shared ethical framework usually based on religion and modified by social custom. For shame to be effective, the target must have some understanding of what they're doing is wrong and be surrounded by others who apply social pressure until the behavior is corrected. Progressives do not share the same value system as conservatives beyond some vague overlap in terminology. You've got to have a shared conception of what's right and what's wrong. Otherwise, you, you know, if you're in the opposite way of thinking, you won't feel shame in the same way. You did this? Can you believe you, I can't believe you did this. And the other person's like, yeah, what's the problem? Because they don't have a shared value system. So today we have uh, very disparate, uh, separate value systems. Uh, different parts of the country are really different, different nations in terms of how they think morally. And so uh, interesting pieces here in this book, The Total State, uh, and he talks about how we got uh, to where we are in spite of the checks and balances and so on. And uh, interesting business also as it goes on and talks about how, how this could end up. I'm not gonna spill the beans and talk about how uh, he thinks it will end up, but uh, yeah, one more item here on page 70. He says this, he says, the Pentagon, the New York Times, Harvard, Facebook, and Apple all think in lockstep and are all eager to wield their influence despite only one of them being a formal government institution. And maybe that's where we need to uh, finish here today. Um, he's pointing out that there is more, we have a separation uh, of church and state on governmental stuff, but when it comes to private industry and, and different wealthy people and so on, there's nothing like that going on. In all these different corporations, what did we list here? Uh, New York Times, the Pentagon, the Pentagon's government, but after that you've got New York Times, private, Harvard University, uh, Facebook, that's private, Apple, that's private, all think in lockstep and are all eager to wield their influence. The people who lead in these different corporations and institutions 
uh, those are those are non-governmental, and yet they all think very similarly. So you can see how that's kind of like the the merchants in Revelation 18 who are crying and they're all up in arms when God intervenes and destroys Babylon and, and takes that down. So anyway, an interesting book, uh, Aaron McIntyre, The Total State, How Liberal Democracies Become Tyrannies. I'm going to put a link to this. I'm not really trying to sell it exactly, you know. I'm, I'm just kind of giving you a reaction to it. But for those who might be interested, if you want to buy it and and um, as an, uh, there's an affiliate link down below, and and uh, I'll get a tiny cut out of that maybe uh, if you if you choose to buy it. I'm not advocating everybody buy this book. Anyway, I found it to be interesting and insightful. I didn't tell you everything about the book because that wouldn't be fair. Plus, there's no, no, not enough time in a review like this, reaction like this. But anyway, uh, looking at uh, the, the where we're living here in this space, you know, from 2020 to 2025, more or less right now, uh, this, we are in the wake of uh, giant historical developments. Uh, I would say, you know, that in the year 2020, we had kind of like the, we had the first global issue of conscience. The Reformation was more in Europe. There have been other issues here and there in certain parts of the world, but uh, it really the most global thing that we've ever experienced as a uh, as a planet, as a planetary civilization of human people, was had to do with things that happened in 2020 and in the year or two immediately after that about you know whether you would take a certain kind of medical treatment or not, and whether that would be forced upon you or not, whether you could travel or not, whether you could see a dying relative in the hospital or not, um, what would you do to, you know, to, to be able to uh, visit with a dying relative? Um, because there was all kinds of impositions uh, on, on personal liberty there. So we really are living in a hinge of history. Uh, things have been changing very dramatically. Just very recently, there have been some extremely uh, dramatic uh, impositions on personal liberty in Britain and the United Kingdom. Uh, digital ID is coming in in Australia now. So yeah, we've got some some really creepy things that are coming into the into our situation. And what, just here yesterday or the day before, the World Health Organization uh, declared another global kind of, you know, international health emergency. And so we're kind of in an interesting place because the last time that happened was uh, way back in early 2020. So I can't tell you the future. I'm not interested in telling it to you. I can tell you from the Bible, you know, how it ends up. But along the way, it's interesting to see this. And he lays some of the blame he, on, on uh, some of it's very circumstantial, but there's also a very intentional uh, thing where we have the total state, uh, the outward ones, you know, like the USSR and, and uh, Nazi Germany, they used force very overtly, and they were more brittle, and they didn't last altogether. But uh, there's been more of a gradual thing here in the West with the United States and other Western countries, and the gradual thing seems to have crept up now to where we're uh, right on the very verge of losing our freedoms. So interesting business here, the total state, how liberal democracies become tyrannies. I'll leave it there, uh, but I find it to be um, really a insightful book. This business of being a Protestant nation, uh, we tend to give the state all kinds of freebies. We give them lots of free passes. Uh, the government's going to do good things for us. It's, it's all going to end happily ever after. It's okay. But when you read the book of Revelation, Revelation 13 and Revelation 18, uh, read Daniel chapter 7, when you see those pieces put together, uh, the picture the Bible picture is not that uh, we all live happily ever after. The Bible picture is not that all these wrinkles get straightened out and we uh, we start flying straight. Um, it, there are tumultuous times and we go into those rapids and we come to the end of Earth's history in this, in this age. So maybe when we pray and give thanks to God, we can thank him, um, not for the glorious freedoms that we have, but for what remains and the opportunities that remain to live for Jesus and serve King Jesus in a world that is very rapidly uh, spinning up into a full-blown total state. All right, 